Tonight, we're gonna tag team a presentation called Tax Incremental Financing 101. Um, we're gonna give a little bit of a background about TIF districts, some definitions, some information, um, and then dive into the current districts and the financials related to that. So the city has retained Ellers Associates to help us look at the districts and make some recommendations moving forward on their financial stability and, and or closure of those districts. So we'll uh, go through some of that in detail. So to start out with, what is a TIF? Um, a TIF is a mechanism for funding development and infrastructure related to redevelopment and or development. Uh, it allows all taxing jurisdictions benefiting from the development to share in its costs. We interchangeably use the word TIF and TID. So a TIF is the actual financing option that allows a municipality, a town, village, or city to fund infrastructure and other improvements through property tax revenue on a new, newly developed property. And a TID is the actual boundary or the district of the uh, area identified by the municipality for the certain type of development. So a little bit about the TID law background. The TIF law was adopted by legislation at the state in 1975 to eliminate blighted areas and urban neighborhoods. Uh, before the TIF law was enacted, a if a municipality wanted to expand its local tax base, the municipality alone would have to pay the cost, but the overlapping taxing jurisdictions would also benefit from the growth. The legislator saw this as a situation as unfair and viewed TIF as a way to help remedy the problem and encourage cooperation between local governments. And the city of Sheboygan's case, the other taxing jurisdictions is the is Sheboygan County, the school district, Sheboygan Area School District, and Lakeshore Technical College. So there's a number of TIDs um, or TIPs, TIDs. Uh, blight elimination. Um, was an early one uh, and that was replaced sometime later by a rehabilitation district. Uh, this district is technically, is typically open for 27 years. Um, an industrial TID is used to fund industrial and business parks and it's open for 20 years. A mixed use district is mixed use development so it could be residential and or commercial. That is open for 20 years and then an environmental uh, district is used to fund environmental cleanup. So how does TIF work? And we've had a lot of discussions about this, but upon creation, the value of the TID is frozen for the property, for property tax distribution purposes. So basically whatever the value of that property within that district is at the time of certification by the Department of Revenue, that's basically held stagnant. And that's the value that the, in our case, the city would get and the taxing jurisdictions would get from a value going into the general fund. Any new value created in the district above that then goes into the district and used to pay down expenditures within the district. Um, <clears throat> so that's kind of, and then when the district closes, all taxing entities start to realize the benefits of the new value. So the, the purpose of this is really economic development tool and to revitalize, in our case, old areas that are vacant or blighted or underutilized, bring some new value in, and then when the district closes, that goes back on the tax rolls and everybody sees a benefit. So there's a number of ways that TIF projects can be funded. Um, it can be done through bonding of a upfront funding um, where the city would go out and borrow the money and give a, basically a grant, if you will, to the developer. Uh, another one is a city-led pay-as-you-go, so that's the one that we typically use. So that's where the developer has to capital outlay the monies, and then based on the income from future tax generation, they get paid back over time. Um, as well as the developer-led pay-as-you-go, I, I guess those could be kind of interchangeably. Um, basically, that they're for they're paying for the improvements in their financing package, and then as they perform over time, we would pay them back. So there's a number of uh, ways that you can amend districts. Uh, four uh, reasons to amend a dif district would be to modify the project plan, to add or subtract property within the TID, to extend the maximum life, or to donate tax increments to other uh, districts. Um, TIF amendments, boundaries may be changed up to four times. There's no limit on the project plan amendments. Um, 
one expenditure period amendment if it's not cash flowing. And then um, both the TID amendments and project plan, plan, project plan changes need to be approved by the Joint Review Board. So what is the Joint Review Board? In our case, it's a representative from the Sheboygan Area School District, one from the Technical College, one from Sheboygan County, a representative from the city and a public member. Um, and then there's the opportunity for an affordable housing extension. So uh, this was added to TIF in 2009, and it allows a city that has a district that has re retired its debt or other obligations to extend the life of the district for one year. And if the city adopts a resolution extending the district for one year and disclose it how it intends to improve its housing stock, um, you can take these funds and use them for other purposes. So uh, the Department of Revenue grants approval on these extensions. 75% um, of the tax increments need to benefit affordable housing uh, anywhere within the city, not just specific to that district. And affordable housing is defined by the uh, law as housing costing no, no more than 30% of the household's gross monthly income. So this is a listing of the current TIDs within the city of Sheboygan. So TIF 6 is uh, South Pier and the lakefront out to the marina. That's our oldest district. TID 10 is the Water Street area, primarily down here along the river. The Kingsbury Apartments and some of those garden uh, toy apartments were included in that. Uh, TID 12 is A Street office building, so that is the uh, Nemsh, uh, what used to be the Nemshaw for Herman Miller office building where Rody Dales is today and the Grand Stay uh, Hotel. So it's a small district kind of on that corner. Um, the land, TID 13 is Landmark Condo. So this is the landmark uh, building that had burnt in 2007 and was rebuilt that includes that property as well as the Founders Club or the old Sheboygan Senior Community. Uh, TID 14 it was originally created for festival foods development and has since expanded to include the Meyer Foods. Uh, TID 15 is the pick and save property and some residential property on the south side of Sheboygan. TID 16 is downtown A Street. Basically, it's A Street from the river up to the Weill Center and then expands out to include the Wells Fargo property to the east. TID 17 is Indiana Avenue, so it's basically from the lake out to 14th Street and then um, down South 7th Street to just shy of King Park. So the old Optenberg property is kind of the southern limit. TID 18 is the South Point Enterprise Campus, our new business center on the south side. TID 19 is the Riverbend neighborhood. This is primarily around the um, Dulmis Decor um, where the Water Street Hotel is being, Watershed Hotel is being developed, the old um, Gloss Coffee Shop, and then the uh, LT, Lakeshore Technical College campus across the road. So it's a small district kind of on the uh, kind of bend in the river. And then the last one, TID 20, is the former Vandervart where Oscar uh, Apartments and Quick Trip are being built. So we're going to dive into the districts a little bit more detail. So the TIF 6, uh, TID 6, the South Pier, you can see the map on the screen. It is a fairly large district. It was created in 1992. Uh, the expenditure period, so anything after that date of 12-31-2017, we're unable to make any further expenditures in that district. And it's uh, slated to close in 2023. It had been amended a number of times. It has gone through a number of years of changing of TIF law. So that's uh, 33 years is the expansion time. That's not really never seen. Um, but there was some challenges with uh, issues related to the South Pier development in Blue Harbor that the legislature took some additional action to extend that district. Um, the estimated close date is uh, this year, it was originally created as a blight elimination district. It has uh, currently is generating around 1.5 million in increments. So that's the new tax value on top of um, basically the revenue that the district is creating. 
And as I mentioned, this one would be eligible for an affordable housing tax credit in 2022 and close in 2022. Um, so we'll talk about what that looks like and what those numbers look like near the end of the slides. But I would, the next one, I would turn it over to Phil to talk about the financials. Great, thank you, Chad. Um, good evening, everyone. Phil Costin with Eller, it's nice to be with you. Uh, we, these are all gonna look very similar. These are our, our uh, materials and we're numbers people, so bear with me. Um, what you'll see here is that in the orange heading is where we're showing the anticipated revenues for a tax increment district. Here we have the tax increment, the revenue, that's actually the increase in valuation and the taxes generated on that. There's exempt computer aid in many of these that are, are kind of held constant uh, by the Department of Revenue. Here you have a ground lease fee, that is revenue that's coming back into this district, uh, some loan receivables, and to a total revenue number. So if you're taking that revenue number minus your obligations, uh, what we're trying to drive down to is, is the district healthy enough at this point to actually close out? Uh, partly why we got involved was to make sure that we're looking at each of the districts uh, with the intent to see if whether or not a district can be closed, if there could be a revenue sharing, should it be amended. We kind of went through all those criteria for each of the districts. Under the expenditures, there are some remaining debt payments, a transfer, and some small administrative costs. And as Chad indicated, in 2022, we would expect to generate enough revenue to be able to close out this district. With the ability to, again, if uh, at, at your, it's a policy decision to keep these districts open, uh, but you would be able to collect a million four forty two of revenue in 2023 uh, to, for affordable housing. So we'll touch on each of these in a little bit and get more into the affordable housing discussion later on. So the next district is TID 10, um, the Water Street. It's set up the same way. There's a map kind of showing the boundaries along the Sheboygan River. This was a blight elimination district created in 1997. Um, would close, could close in 2024 or earlier. It generates about $392,400 in uh, TIF increment revenue. Um, it is eligible for the affordable housing extension as well and to close in 2022. So I will let Phil talk about this one. All right, thank you, Chad. And again, if you look at the same setup as the last one, I'm not gonna walk through each of the numbers here, but again, in the, in the orange heading are all the revenues uh, and the expenditures are all in the, in the green. Uh, you do have a development incentive with Van Horn Development Group here. Uh, that will be fully paid off in 2023. There are some general fund advances that are gonna be reimbursed back to the general fund uh, as part of this district. And again, uh, what we're projecting in the balance columns in 2022, you would have the ability again to close this district out with the possibility again of retaining one year's of revenue for affordable housing. The next district is TID 12, the E Street office building and Grand State, and then some of the uh, Wild Center, Black Pig, and some of the parking lots. So this district, like the other ones, is a rehabilitation district created in 2000, uh, would close, could close in 2027. This is a donor district to TID 17, so this is uh, sharing revenues from this district to TID 17, which was Indiana Avenue. Um, however, that may not be needed in the future because TID 17 is doing better than um, anticipated. So this district generates around 191,776 in revenues and like the other districts is eligible for the affordable housing. Yeah, again, uh, much smaller district, uh, much smaller revenue amounts here. Uh, one of the things we discovered quickly uh, as we got into TID number 17 was that we really didn't need to share additional revenue with 17, which then freed up uh, the ability for TID number 12 to close out in 2022 as well. 
as Chad indicated, TID 17 is healthy enough at this point. There's been enough development uh, for it to support itself without revenue coming from another district. So this district will be looked to be will be looking to close out in 2022 as well. The next one, TID 13, landmark condos. Um, as I said before, it's primarily the landmark condos and the Founders Club or the Sheboygan, the old Sheboygan Senior Community, a very small district really generated uh, to uh, facilitate the development of the condo project. So it was created in 2005. Uh, expenditure period runs through 27, 2027, and it has an end date of 2032. Um, it is a donor district like TID 12 with TID 17, generates around 442,000 and would be eligible for the affordable housing tax credit. I've been around so long I created this district back in 2005, so um, I'm back. <laughs> so uh, this district again was created back as Chad indicated. Uh, this is a, a, a blight district, meaning it could stay open for a lot longer uh, period of time. Uh, but again, uh, decision at least at the staff level at this point is to close this district out uh, since revenue it doesn't need to be shared with 17 as well. So uh, this will be able to be closed out and again, possibly up to about $400,000 available for affordable housing also. TID 14, the Taylor Heights Festival Foods and Meyer. So you can see the district that this uh, covers primarily the uh, area around Taylor and Erie Avenue and some of the on and off ramps and then the old, the Sunny Ridge and some of that redevelopment area to the northeast, I guess you could say. So this was created in 2011, could close in 2031. It was created as a mixed use district, which would give it a maximum life of 20 years. It generates about 1.5 million a year in revenues and uh, like the other ones is eligible for the housing, affordable housing extension. Yes, I was involved in this district creation as well. Um, and um, really this, this really was the old Menards uh, building that uh, was then turned into Festival of Foods. No, Walmart. Walmart, sorry, uh, Walmart building. It has been a while, thank you. Uh, back, back a while. So again, similar to the other districts, uh, we expect this district to be able to pay off all its obligations with the cum cumulative balance uh, that remains. And uh, again, in 2022, be able to close out this district. TID 15, the pick and save. Um, so this was used for the redevelopment of the what used to be the Kmart into the pick and save that unfortunately sits vacant. However, there is a lease that they're, they're paying the, the same rate as if they were in the building. So the developer really has no interest in um, going out and finding a tenant, but the tax value has to our benefit stayed at the high level as if the building is occupied. So this was created in 2011 as well. Um, would Could have a closure of 2031 as a mixed use district for 20 years. Um, revenue is about 230,000 um, and is eligible for the housing extension in 2024 and could close in 2024 because there's some obligations that still need to be met. Again, very similar story here. There are obligations here that run through 2024. There's a cumulative balance that's been built up in that, in that TID fund and again, enough and 22 are ready to close out this district. Uh, this is one you could, you could probably keep open for other purposes in that neighborhood, but uh, without another prospect, it makes sense to close this out at this time. TID 16, the downtown Sheboygan A Street, as I said, basically runs from the visitor center uh, property all the way up to Wisconsin Avenue. And then that little leg that goes to the east is the wall. Uh, Wells Fargo and some property that they own uh, west of North 6th Street, I think that is. Um, so anyway, that district was created in 2015. It was created to provide development incentives to develop the High Point Apartments and the Encore Apartments. Um, it's a 20-year district. It runs through 2035. Um, its annual income is around 587000 
Um, so there's a little bit more to tell here. Yeah, so if you spend a little bit of time looking at this uh, cash flow and you look at the last columns on the right where it says annual and cumulative, you'll see that uh, for the time being this district is in the red. Um, not unusual for newer districts to be in the red until development really picks up. Uh, there's projected shortfalls for the next couple of years. Uh, until a lot of the debt and the incentives fall off. We fully expect that will be fully reimbursed back. And in 2032, this district will be in the black and we'll have the ability to close out at that time, which will still be five years earlier than the maximum life. So it, it's just taking a little time to, to work its way through. But uh, from all project, our projections at this point, it will be a healthy district in, in the future. So this is a real example of how what TIF is set up for is to take on a lot of debt in the beginning and then pay it off over time as the increment comes in. There ha there was some um, there's been a number of capital projects that have been uh, funded against this district, like the uh, updates to the street lighting to LED conversion along A Street. So that's an ongoing uh, expense that has been built into this as well. So TID 17 is the uh, Indiana district, it was created in 2018, so it's relatively new. It's a 27-year district. Um, it could run through 2042. Um, it sees increment revenue of about 800,000 per year. Um, and the indications are that it will be, it'll do fine. It'll be, ca it'll be positive cash flow moving forward. Um, it was really created to facilitate some of the redevelopment along Indiana Avenue, the former Pentair property, and then the Optenberg property to the south. So you can see that it's a relatively large district. Um, it has seen some successful projects with the Badger State Lofts and the uh, condo development that occurred along the Sheboygan River. And then uh, should the development on the former Kepsel move forward, that will only help it out a lot more. So um, it, it right now is a recipient of TIDs 12 and 13, but uh, going forward, it has plenty of cash flow that it doesn't necessarily need that. Yeah, if you look at the, uh, the revenue projections and you look at the projected revenue, uh, you'll see that we do show in the third and fourth, or fourth and fifth columns from the left, the revenues that have come in from 12 and 13. And then the third column from the right is that cumulative balance. So there is a healthy fund balance in this tax increment district in part, I think, through from revenues from TID 12, 13, a little bit of bond proceeds, some land sale as well. Um, we expect this district, if you look at the cumulative column, to stay in the black through the life uh, and, again, close out well early, 11 years earlier than the allowed life of the district at this point. Um, be a very successful district for the city. So the next few uh, districts are pretty new and there's some um, opportunities. So there is, you won't see a Ehlers um, comparison on these because we're, um, it, because of the, the age, frankly. So I'm just going to go through some of the details and then uh, there won't be any additional slides on the performance. But the TID 18 South Point Enterprise Campus created in 2018, the expenditure period uh, through 2035. The end date uh, was 2038, has now been approved by the Department of Revenue to 2040. Um, and that's based on an update of the lack, basically to try to get us through the pandemic because we haven't had a lot of development out there as was originally anticipated. So. Um, we had worked with Ellers to extend this to 2040 to cover some cash flow issues going forward. Um, and we believe that it will make, it's got about 15 to 18 million or so of outstanding debt, but we believe in the end it'll ultimately make it, uh, it'll cash flow itself. Um, right now it's generating around 900,000 in revenue um, is what we budgeted. Uh, and that's primarily from the uh, FedEx project that's also in this district and some improvements that Torganol's making in our current business center. 
TID 19 Riverbend neighborhood. So this was also created in 2018. It'll close in 2038. It's a mixed use district. You can see where this is. Um, the, this is a fluid situation. We've got a number of developments happening. Um, we may need to extend this to include the former May Line and the adjacent redevelopment authority property, JP Marine along Commerce Street to facilitate some redevelopment and some street construction upgrades in that area going forward. And then the last one is the TID 20, which is the former Vandervart. This was a 27 year district created in 2020, um, closes in 2047 as a rehabilitation district and could uh, basically has minimal uh, debt against it other than some street lights on Georgia Avenue and potentially some trail improvements. So this could be a future uh, donor district with other rehabilitation districts if needed or close early. This has to pay a, a fairly large TIF incentive, almost seven and a half million dollars to the roughly $47 million Oscar apartment deal. You want to talk about this? Sure. <clears throat> well, here's the good news, folks. It's it's really um, a situation where the, uh, you have a lot of activity in districts, districts that have been around for quite some time, and you're at a point where you have the ability to close out six of the districts uh, this year. Uh, and there's some financial impacts to that. There's, there's really three impacts. Uh, one is that the city, like most other communities in the state of Wisconsin, are are trying to figure out workforce and affordable housing. This will be one avenue uh, to deal with that. So what we projected, uh, if you close out in 22 of these six districts, that if you look at where it says anticipated amount for affordable housing, uh, the projection is about $3.9 million that would go into a fund that Chad talked about earlier, that there are some, some, um, some you know, to kind of work through the process of how the funds can be used, but it's really earmarked for affordable housing. So it'll be a really good uh, start to a fund in the city of Sheboygan that will allow the city to be more active in working towards uh, workforce and affordable housing issues. Second, uh, when we look at tax impact of, of anticipated borrowings and, and, and your operating levy, one of the benefits of closing out districts is you get a big bump in valuation where you're spreading uh, the overall operations and debt over a larger tax base. Closing out these districts is about $190 million of value will come back online. Uh, that will help absorb, again, future increases in both operating and debt service uh, and kind of uh, hopefully level out uh, the tax levy uh, as well. And then finally, the third is that I mentioned earlier in TIT number 10, there's a general fund reimbursement of about 419,000. I'll go back to the general fund. So you'll get a bump in valuation, which, which helps when it comes budget time. Uh, that'll really take effect in budget year 2024. You have about $3.9 million that'll go into an affordable housing fund and a little bit of money coming back to the general fund as well. <clears throat> so wrapping this up, so the last couple slides here are just some f information that we hear all the time. How many TIDs can a city have? Obviously, if we close six districts, we'll be creating additional opportunity should the need arise. But the state statute requires that the equalized value of taxable property in all districts does not exceed 12%. Um, with the most recent creation of uh, TID 20, um, the city's total equalized value of existing TIDs was around 190 million, and we could go up to a maximum of 350 million. So uh, we, prior to that, if we didn't close any districts, would have still plenty of value to do that. Um, but with closing districts, obviously that total number will go down. A um, couple advantages of TIDs, it can increase property values, spur private development, create a stronger, broader tax base, uh, stimulates the investment outside the district typically and benefits the underlying taxing districts at the end of the TIF as we just discussed. Um, some disadvantages if the uh, district doesn't materialize as planned, the city may have to find other sources to fund it and that's kind of where some of those advances from the general fund have happened over the years. 
uh, TIDs may be used in areas where development would have not normally occurred, and uh, it can increase the uh, administrative burden of, burden of managing these local districts. So that's it in a nutshell. If there's any questions, we would be happy to answer them. All right. Thanks, Chid and Phil, for that very informative and engaging conversation. Um, any questions from Alders? Uh, Alder Flicky Paneski. Thank you. Um, for an example, TID 13, right now, if we close it, we get about 200000 of revenue. If we keep it open, if I read the charts correctly, if we keep it open, we get a million dollars in a couple more years. Is that accurate? Yeah, I think it's 300000 is the revenue, the increment that's generated. So either that would keep going into building up a fund balance or uh, in this case could be shared with the donor district, which was TID 17. I don't know where the $1.5 million would have came from. Okay, I guess more generally, my question is, when I looked at the when I looked at the charts, closing closing them out now gives us a certain dollar amount. If we wait another year, we get a higher increment. Is that accurate? You want to answer that? Yeah. Go ahead, Mr. Clausen. Pull this up, sure. It was TID 13 that I was looking at. Yeah, uh, so there's a couple of things there. One, um, once you have, the state statute is very clear that once you have. I don't know why this is different, but it's not advancing the slides. Sorry. Oh, okay. I tried to find it for you. Uh, okay. Well, I'll just answer it generally. Sure. So the statutes are very clear that once you have met all the obligations, that you're required statutorily to close out the district. You can't just keep it open to build a fund balance okay. uh, in a tax increment district. So to keep it open, in the case of TID 13, you would have to undertake additional capital expenditures to keep it open. If there aren't expenditures that be made in TID 13, then statutorily you're required to close out the district. I think the decision by staff has been, at this point there are no future capital expenditures in that area, therefore, we don't need to share the revenue with TID number 17 right. anymore. Let's close out the district. Okay, that answered my question. Thank you. Any other follow-ups, Alder Flicky Paneski? No. Nope. Any additional questions from Alders? All right. Thank you, Chad. Thank you, Phil. Thank, Thank you, you, Ehlers, for all your work and uh, keeping the TIFs rolling and in pretty good health. Thank you. <laughs>